Okay, are we ready to start? So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are starting our webinar and today with us, Brandon Young. Um, uh, he is CEO of uh, Data Drive and uh, Seller System, uh, very famous uh, Appian leader on Amazon market, our colleague, seller and uh, our friends. So, uh, today uh, we're going to uh, speak about SEO, uh, Amazon strategy, uh, PL business on Amazon, and many other things. Uh, and um, let me introduce my colleague uh, Rastislav Ross, uh, his team lead uh, in our team, and um, we will uh, ask uh, many questions uh, from ben, Brandon Young and. Uh, uh, I hope um, uh, we will have fun. So, Brandon, uh, let's start uh, speak about SEO. Uh, and uh, um, please share your opinion. Uh, how has Amazon ranking algorithm um, changed uh, over the years? And uh, uh, what sellers should prioritize uh, for optimal uh, optimize uh, SEO? <clears throat> well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, SEO has been uh, really uh, something that changes pretty frequently on Amazon. They're constantly updating their, their ranking algorithm, and it just gets new layers of complexity. I remember uh, 2016, when I first started Private Label, I remember that velocity is all that mattered, right? So they, you had services like Viral Launch that came out that you would be able to give away products for $1. And if you gave away enough products because of enough sales, you could rank to the top of any keyword. And Casey Goss, who started Viral Launch, is a friend of mine, but he he has very um, explicit stories of sellers who would sell supplements and uh, very fast-moving categories. And they would give away every single day hundreds of units forever because they could sell over a thousand units every single day organically because of it, right? And so the and the margin was so good that it made sense to do that. So Amazon knew that this was an issue. They've updated the algorithm to include uh, a formula. And the formula is quite simple, but also complex. The formula is performance times relevancy. And so the performance side is going to be the click-through rate, the conversion rate, and the revenue. Uh, and the revenue piece was added at that time so that discounted products don't help you. And then the relevancy piece is so that they, they make sure that the buyer is seeing what they're searching for. So if you search for dog food, you don't see dog toys, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's important is to know how they have uh, different uh, histories uh, scheduled in too, where they have to know that the most recent history uh, can be weighted more, but the older history matters too. So you have a, an, a different averages over different periods of time being multiple to, multiplied together. And then that is all times the, the relevancy. So uh, SEO is... Uh, both an art and a science, but it's solved. Uh, and so we base our strategies on how to rank products by understanding how the algorithm currently is. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. So I, I just wanted to ask, uh, so there are lots of different opinions about the importance of different metrics. So uh, let's talk uh, like about, I don't know, some uh, main ones like uh, conversion rate, CTR, uh, the amount of organic sales, the amount of uh, advertising sales and stuff like that. So uh, in your opinion, what metrics are the most uh, important one today for today's algorithm? Yeah, so it's definitely comes down to conversion rate being at the top. Um, click-through rate and revenue being next and then relevancy. So it's um, there's a hierarchy there with conversion rate being one of the most primary um, examples because 
if you're um now you you have other factors that are going to give you some juice on ranking which is part of the performance which is like add to carts browsing the natural behavior of the buyer um and so they use those as another form of multiplier as well because if the natural form of the buyer is uh like the natural behavior of the buyer is is different then they reduce the impact of that action so uh, a buyer comes in typically and they will look at multiple competitors they will read the reviews at a certain percentage of them will browse down and look at the reviews a certain percentage will look at a certain number of images a certain number of them will look at a plus content a certain number of them will add it to cart and only a percentage, maybe 40% of the people that added to cart in most categories will actually buy it. So if you send too much traffic that goes straight to your listing that adds it to cart and buys it every single time, Amazon knows that that is unnatural. And so they will, they have a way of detecting that and then they will uh, negatively impact you versus positively. Okay. So uh if we're talking about uh, external traffic for amazon what is your opinion about that so we're not talking about like some paid uh, stuff and uh, some great schemes but uh, about like uh, organic uh, traffic from outside of the amazon from google from bing and uh, other um but what do you think uh, how uh, how important for now to evolve external traffic for your listing uh, how relevant and uh, how can this help uh, to uh, grow your uh, ranking so outside traffic is is something that they're trying to solve and they're iterating the algorithm a lot um, a few years ago outside traffic was seen the same as inside traffic, meaning uh, that the conversion rate, the click-through rate, the performance of that traffic impacted and blended with the overall performance of the internal traffic. So if someone clicks on an ad uh, on Amazon, a pay one of your ads, and someone clicks on one of your ads on Facebook, they would then bring it down and then blend all that performance together the problem with that is that Facebook ads convert much lower because people are not in the same uh, cycle of buying. You're interrupting them. They're not looking to buy. So the conversion rate is much lower. And so they had to fix that because they want to encourage outside traffic. And what that was doing was the opposite. So now what they do is they keep it as a separate pool of performance. And... Um, they are tweaking the value of the performance uh, because the performance matters and it's still multiplied. But for as of a, like a year ago, there was no negative. You would send a thousand buyers and only two would purchase. Then you would get two extra sales added to your performance of your of your product with no negative uh, around how many conversion clicks and, and browsing and anything else that happened. It was just the conversion going over and impacting your, your performance for rank. So you would see a lift from outside traffic now uh, because there's no negative. And so it's very powerful. Not only that, the source of the outside traffic uh, will give you a multiple. So Facebook is 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 maybe one to one, and um, TikTok might be two to one, and Google might be five to one, right? So you have different multiples on the amount of credit they give you before it gets blended into your average, and so it's very powerful, but it's it's it can be expensive, and you have to have a product that converts. And you have to put a lot of extra effort. So they want to reward you for that because those are sales that they wouldn't make if you weren't running ads. Those are sales that would stay on Facebook and maybe purchase it from Google or from another buyer or from a, someone else's website, from Target, Walmart, wherever. So when they Amazon wants to encourage us to drive traffic, so they want to reward us with that lift in, 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 uh, in rank. So outside traffic is very impactful. Okay, but let's say that uh, normally we have like a 10% conversion for our product 
And if we're running uh, external traffic, uh, let's imagine that we have like one or two percent. So it's 10 or five times uh, worse than uh, inside. Yeah, Amazon it doesn't traffic. work that way anymore. Yeah. So it's, it's so two you, separate. You the performance is weighted in two different pools now. Yeah. Yeah, but do you think that uh, if uh, performance is uh, worse for such a great amount, like tens, uh, 10 times or five times worse, is it still uh, worth it to uh, lead external traffic? That's a business decision based on the profitability of your product and what the benefit, like what, what is, what, how is that impacting your tacos essentially? So generally so you'll spend, generally you'll spend a lot less money on Google every day than you will on pay-per-click. So even if the performance is worse, that extra lift will impact ranks in a way that makes uh, your organic traffic, your organic sales go up. So you're as a blended average, your tacos goes down. Okay, so I think I think that's uh, great that we uh, talk about that because it, I think it is very important and that's some stuff that not everyone knows about that you need to understand your like general profitability and not look into some like uh, ACOS results and that stuff. So thank you very much. Yeah. And I think so, a lot uh, of, a lot of people will also give up too soon, right? It can take 30 days before you start to see the impact of those outside ads, because you're not, you're not doing a lot every day and you have those averages that I talked about. So you impact the average for one day, it doesn't do a lot. You impact the average for seven days, it doesn't do a lot. It depends on the history of that product. So it takes a long time sometimes to really move uh, products, keyword ranks on older products. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe you can provide some insights on how your software, Datadive, has helped uh, sellers optimize their Amazon business and uh, to achieve better results maybe some uh, success stories. Yeah, we have dozens and dozens of examples of sellers who neglected um, a word. So the most, what a lot of sellers don't, don't fail to realize. So if you've had, if you have any type of success already, it's because you've dialed in your conversion rate and your performance. Um, if you're selling a product and it's performing well versus your competition, good click-through rate, good conversion rate, Sometimes there are keywords you're just not ranking well on. So there's two things that Datadive does. First of all, it shows you where you're not ranking well because you might not even know that you that that's a root word or a keyword or a phrase that people use to find that product. You might not even have it on the map or radar. You might not even know. So Datadive shows it to you. The second thing that it does is it gives you a listing builder that takes all of the keyword research and it gives you a value for what you should put in your listing to maximize your revenue and your rank, right? So how are you gonna get the most traffic? What is the way to write the title in the listing to maximize your traffic, right? So everything in Amazon comes down to just two things, traffic and conversions. Traffic is going to be paid and organic. Organic is your lift from your ranks on your organic, your organic keyword ranks. Your paid is your pay-per-click. The performance is 100% on you. The performance is gonna be the offer you have, how good your offer is. So how good your images are, the color you chose, the design you chose, um, how it performs. So what Datadive wants to do is give you the visibility on what are the keywords and the root words that are driving sales for this product, all of them. And then what are the competitors doing right? What are the competitors doing wrong? And then if you've already launched the product, what are you doing right? And what are you doing wrong? And then how do you write the listing to do better, to do the best? This is what Datadive does. Mm -hmm. so okay, if, Brendan, if talking about, uh, yeah, sorry, just uh, one little question about that and we can move on. Um, about uh, when, you, when you were talking about uh, what our competitors and we do uh, wrong or right, so maybe you can give some specifics here. What are you talking about specifically? Yeah, I can give you a great example. Um, let me pull one up for you, actually. Uh, I think it might might be helpful to, to see it visually. Uh, is this replay going to be all video or is it also going to be audio? Uh, video and audio, of course. <laughs> 
Okay. This is, uh, let me pull this example up. Yeah, I was wondering if it was also going to be released as a podcast where everyone watching the replay can't see it. Uh, that that was my oh. question. Ah, I got, I got it. No, so it's going to be only a video. Okay. So this is the, the foundation of Data Dive, right? It's called the master keyword list. Essentially, it's a matrix that, that crosses all of the keywords that all of the best sellers are ranked well for, right? In Data Dive, you can have up to 40 competitors in this matrix. And what you're going to find is that you have many, many um, sellers that are doing well, but they're doing well on different keywords. They're not all doing well on all the same keywords. So that's where you can sometimes find the opportunity. So if we look here, here are the keywords on the left, right? And here are the best sellers across the top. And there are 69 keywords that are relevant for this product that drive sales. And there's 162,000 search volume. Now, sometimes we have some outlier keywords, like um, this one has uh, 55,000 uh, search volume and outlier keywords. And if I want to see what those are, what that means is that there are only one or two sellers that are taking advantage of those. And if you see here, you've got the name brand, right? Now, the name brand is really relevant for this, for this product because they do a lot of TikTok. This is a garlic press in the shape of a, of a Dracula. And this brand is owned by the Branded, which is a big aggregator. They do a lot of TikTok videos. And you'll see that they rank for keywords that are very unique to them, which also concludes like vampire garlic press. Because people will watch the ad and they'll watch the video on TikTok, but they don't remember the brand name because it's a very difficult brand name to remember. So what they do is they go and search for the vampire garlic press. Very interesting, interesting. right? But yeah. that's, that's the insights of those extra keywords that only one or two sellers are taking advantage of that you need to make a decision. Can I also take advantage of those keywords? What we're trying to do is make the story make sense because if this seller is only on 90% of the search volume of the first page of all of the other relevant, highly relevant keywords, right? Why do they have more sales than someone who's on 96%, right? Uh, 97%. This guy, Kintensu, is on 97% of the search volume on the first page. He's very good at Amazon, but he only has 7,500 sales units per month. And this guy has 9,900 units per month at 90%. There's only two reasons. The first will be if this price, this guy is selling much cheaper. He sells more units. He converts more, right? The other part is if he has outlier keywords that are driving sales. Uh, or if he has better ranks. He has worse ranks. He sells for a higher price. But the story is complete because he's on those other keywords, 55,000 other searches, right? So we start to understand by looking at the data in the right way, the complete story of how are the competitors getting the sales. Now, if you want to ask, what are they doing right and what are they doing wrong, then look here. This guy is ranked well for garlic mincer and garlic crusher. Those are the two other most popular ways to search for garlic press, right? Most popular way is garlic press. Second is garlic mincer. Third is garlic crusher. Three different, very different words different root words, right? Now, he's not doing good with stainless steel, two stainless steel keywords, because this product is not stainless steel. So there's nothing they can do there. The same thing for Zule, who is uh, owned by Aaron Cordova. Like uh, he's, he's good at Amazon and his product does great, but these two keywords he's not good on because his product is not stainless steel either. If you look at it, it's a bunch of different uh, types of uh, uh, like flat material. I don't know uh, what you would call it, right? Maybe aluminum. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Maybe. Right? But it's not stainless steel. So he doesn't rank for stainless steel keywords. It makes sense. Here's another stainless steel keyword. He's only number 27. So 
He's great on every keyword except for the stainless steel keywords. And well, funny enough, he's not doing good for the Dracula keyword because he's not a Dracula garlic crusher, right? Or garlic press or garlic crusher, which makes sense that this guy's number one because he's the only one and everyone else isn't, right? So let's look at a major brand like KitchenAid. KitchenAid here, garlic crusher, they're not even indexed. The third most popular way to call this product a billion dollar brand did not do a good job at making sure that they established relevancy. So why did why did they not establish relevancy? It's because they don't write garlic crusher or garlic mincer anywhere in the listing. What they do is they write press crush and mince garlic. But nowhere in their listing do they establish authority and relevancy with Amazon by writing the exact keyword. The way that you establish the highest form of relevancy is to write the exact phrase, right? They don't have it anywhere in their listing. So Amazon's not sure it's relevant, so they don't rank well for it. So you take that information, you take the value of these keywords based on the keyword density, right? If we break down the roots, let's go look here. We look at all the repeated words and phrases in order to really understand the data. So we've got uh, garlic press uh, 23 times, garlic mincer, right? Seven times, garlic crusher six times with this much broad search volume. You've got stainless steel. Uh, you've got garlic slicer. If your product has a slicer, slightly different product, but can do both. Garlic presser, a lot less popular, but another good word, right? So we understand the different root words, the keyword density, the search volume, the relevancy, and then our listing builder can factor all of that in. So if I clear all of this data and I want to, I want to give an idea of how good these, these listings are, this is what we call our ranking juice. We give you a real score to determine your rank potential. And if I use my algorithm to write it for me, because I know all the values, then my software, Datadive, will actually just write it for you. And you can see my score is now instantly higher with this title. And I've got 50 characters left for you to make it more readable, to put the brand name, to do whatever you want. Now, the next thing that we do now is that we put only two or three keywords per bullet, and we will use AI to write the bullet. That's been delayed. It should release next week for you. So you hit another button, and the AI will go in and actually write these bullets for you based on the avatar of who typically buys this product and the benefits that that's they want. Some, that's some great stuff, I want to say. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing this with us. Okay, uh, Brandon, I have a question. Uh, tell me, what are the common pitfalls, mistake of uh, new Amazon sellers who launch their first product on Amazon? So the first problem usually comes around uh, product selection, right? Uh, they're either going to choose a product that is way too competitive. Uh, they don't understand how to... Um, how to op, like how to choose the product based in data. So they choose the wrong product. And then they don't know how to write the product. They don't know how important images are. And then the biggest, another big mistake they make is that they don't order enough units. So um, either they choose the product that they don't have enough money to get into because they see other people are making sales. So they think I can order 50 or 100 or 500, but they really needed to order 2000, right? And so they run out of stock for a long time uh, and it fails because they come back uh, and the rank is now impacted because a lot of negative history was averaged in when like the algorithm we talked about. So product selection, understanding to match your budget, to understand what keywords are driving sales and if you can beat your competition, what like the risk of a product based on the data. Um, that's going to be the biggest mistake I see. And then the second part is going to be around um, how to effectively run pay-per-click to push ranks and the objective there. A lot of new sellers will try to run ads that are, are only profitable. And it's very difficult to do that because they don't understand the way that ads impact keyword ranks. Mm -hmm. So they look at it from an ACOS perspective, which is very narrow and wrong, instead of a tacos perspective. And they don't know the difference because they're a new seller. Okay, and uh, how new sellers can avoid this mistake uh, when they 
and doesn't know a lot about uh, about Amazon. So, yeah, I think the best thing to do, honestly, and and I'm not saying it just because it's my my software. I, I did it because I launch over 100 products a year, right? So, I develop the software to to make sense to tell me the story to to how are the sellers doing getting their sales like i always wanted to answer those questions so i would take all of this data and i would i would manipulate the data and it would take me hours to analyze a product what are they doing right what are they doing wrong what's the risk like uh what average price point all of these things like uh you know what we've done now is that this entire sheet is done for you in 60 seconds once you choose all the competitors and then we develop this questionnaire to give you a score for the product. So if you answer the questions about traffic, about the keywords, remember everything's traffic and conversions, right? So you answer the, tra the, answer the questions about the traffic, the keywords. You answer about the profitability, the potential of the product for you to improve it and the competitiveness of the product. So you analyze the competitors. There's a lot of questions about the competitors. For every single answer you give, you will get a positive, a neutral, or a negative score. So if over seven of the top 10 competitors have over a thousand reviews, that's not good, right? It's minus points. So at the end of it, you will have a score and you will understand whether to do a product or not. Because the key is that a lot of people are lazy and they don't want to spend a lot of time researching products. The reality is it's a numbers game. If you analyze hundreds and hundreds of products, you might only find a few that are worth doing. So for every hundred products that I do a deep analysis on, I might only order samples on two of them. Okay. So if you only analyze 10 products and you choose the best of the 10, you still aren't choosing a good product a lot of the time. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, uh, maybe let's talk about the uh, inventory levels a little bit. So how do you uh, effectively manage inventory levels? Uh, how do you forecast uh, the level of uh, inventory that you should uh, order? Because a lot of uh, private label sellers uh, have a lot of problems with this when they don't know uh, how many they should buy and stuff like that. So that's a, I think that's a very common mistake. And that's a very uh, common problem. Yeah, so figuring out how many to order is really important, right? So if you're if you're looking here and if you don't understand how the sellers are getting their sales, you don't know whether you can duplicate that success. So the question is, again, back to the data, the keywords, how are the sellers getting their sales and how will you get your sales? What can you realistically expect to accomplish in the first 30 and 60 days of your launch? It takes a little bit of experience to understand that. You can learn from someone like you guys or someone else that can kind of explain it to you. You can use the software. So the way I look at it is this, and this is a tough example um, because everyone's pretty good. 12 of the sellers are very, very strong. But let me, let me stop sharing. Let me find another product really quickly that is better, uh, a better example of... I wouldn't do a garlic press, guys. <laughs> don't 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 yeah, sell okay. a garlic press. Let me see if I can do one on a product that I passed on recently. Okay, this has a lot of different, uh, I don't like this product uh, personally, but um, this has a lot of different things. So this is a toy, right? And it looks like these little army men. There are several different styles, which you need to be aware of as well, because you need to understand what style sells better. Do you need to sell one with um, vehicles and people and a big car? Do you want to sell just uh, bigger people that are more detailed? Do you want to sell just the green guys, right? Like just the, and, and then what size green guy? So there's a wide range of decisions to make. What I do is I look at the overall market, the best sellers of the overall market of this theme. 
of uh, this niche, and then I narrow it down. If I if I want to analyze more of just the little men, then I'll do a dive with only the little men, right? So just be aware that you need to get very detailed into the different style that you're going to choose and make sure that if you choose to do the um, this one with the more detailed guys, that you test your little guys versus that little, those little guys, and that an audience is choosing yours more than these guys, right? It's just make sure that you're going to convert before you even place the order. But from a launch perspective, let's say I've got a product, I vetted it, I designed it, I know it's going to sell well, it's going to convert, um, and I've decided to order it. How many do I order? What I'm looking at here is I'm going to look at this search volume. Uh, the percentage of the search volume that these guys are ranked for on the first page. We have 248 keywords and 180,000 search volume, right? And I've excluded some keywords here uh, in order to make the list more relevant. So I took out keywords. Huh, that's still wrong. It's weird. But you would take out keywords that are not relevant uh, from this list. So if I sort by search volume, I might, uh, uh, one way to do it would be to find a keyword here, like this is a brand name. I can right click and I can hit exclude keyword. I can click it and I can exclude keyword. Either way, you can remove it from the list and then it cleans the data up and makes it better, right? So you wanna go through and you wanna clean it up. After you clean it up, you're going to go in and you're going to look at the percentage that these guys are ranked on. You're going to make sure that they're not getting sales from outlier keywords. These are the outlier keywords over here. And you've got Mr. River getting uh, 58,000 search volume extra on that he's on the first page. We don't know if he's converting on it, but he's ranked on it. And so we would see, okay, he's ranked number one for G.I. Joe. Major brand name, cartoon. Um, I don't know if these are actually G.I. Joe uh, cartoon set. It doesn't say, but he's done a really good job of imitating the look of G.I. Joe, the cartoon. And so he ranks number one on that keyword. Very, very interesting, right? And you've got, um, so you have to imagine he's converting and getting sales from there that you're not going to get. The question is, is he, can I duplicate that? I don't think so. Uh, it will be very difficult for me to take a lot of sales from a keyword that I don't own like that. So another thing is G.I. Joe. So he's got these two. The other thing might be that if I do a style like this, and if he's converting without being G.I. Joe licensed, maybe I can too. So maybe I can attribute some sales there. So I want to actually try to rank for that. So I can move these G.I. Joe keywords back to the master keyword list to include them. So I write them and target them. The problem is you can't write it into your listing because it's a brand, it's a trademark, right? So you have to find other ways to index and target it with pay-per-click with other strategies. But if I move it over, I can do that. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at the percentage of search volume on this master keyword list that actually drives sales for most of these products, these relevant keywords. And if I see here 48% making 900 sales per month, I, I think I can beat 48% um, within my first 30 days. I think I can get to 60 to 70%. So here's 70%, 800. 60%, 700. Uh, this is a weird set because this is more of the big vehicle, right? And like, so are these, but you should probably look at more consistent to actually do this math, right? You want to look at the ones that are more like you. But uh, um, for the purpose of this exercise, I'm showing you how we would do it. 74%, 600 sales, 71%, 500 sales, 70%, 400. What I do is I take an average of those 60 to 70% that I think, and I think I can realistically get similar keyword ranks. If this list is, is cleaned up, then I think I can get that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna say 800, 780, 600, 500, 400. I think I can get about 600 sales a month fairly easily with confidence. I'm gonna order three months of inventory. I'm gonna order 1800 units. This is how I do it. It's, it's understanding what I think I can duplicate from a success level of being on the first page of most of these keywords at better ranks than my competition 
for the most part, especially if they're ranked like this guy's ranked top 10 for most keywords. I probably can't beat him. So his 70% is stronger than my 70%. So I don't think I can get 800 sales. Maybe I can get seven or 600 sales, right? So the more you look at the data and you understand what are they doing to get their sales, what can I do? And you start to really understand that that will let you know how many to order because I know that they're selling 800 units a month. They're ranked pretty good for most keywords. They only have a couple holes. And these are the ones that I just brought over. I can actually get rid of them, right? Let me send those back. But they've got military toys. They're not doing a good job. So if I go to this guy's listing and I look for military toys, I probably won't find it. I might find military, but I won't find military toys. And as you see, no military toys in the title. If they update their title and they put military toys, that rank would go from 80 to the top 10, probably, right? Because now they're establishing relevancy. So this guy's a good seller. He's at 94% uh, of the search volume, but he's not great. He could be better. All right. So that's how we decide how many to order. Great. So um, when you're establishing uh, like uh, the results, anyway, when you're thinking about that, when you evaluate uh, the stuff that you just talked about, uh, do you uh, include in your formula any season data? Because uh, you're considering a product yeah. to launch and uh, in a month, so that, that's going to be like very different. Uh, that's an awesome sale question. That you can get. Yeah, yeah, that, that is an awesome question. If you see here, we provide you with the Google trend data and the uh, Amazon. A lot of times the Amazon will be laid in here as well. And you'll see that there's different spikes based on the time of year. So I think it's really important that you understand whether the market is going up over time and what year, what time of the year spikes happen. And if you look here, you have the same, right? We provide you with um, these, these charts so you can see the ranks over time. Essentially, this is from Keepa, right? And Keepa has very good data. Here's your sales data over time. This one, this is That's a spike so here. This is Q4, December. And you go to 138 sales a, 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 a day. And during uh, the rest of the year, it was only 14 sales a day. Now, they maintain their rank through the new year and improve their ranks, right? And they're averaging 50, 50, 50, 60. And now here through May, it's going up again. And I think through the holiday, if we look at back at uh, far enough, maybe if we go to their listing, it's very important. So if I'm, if maybe summer is better for this toy, because a lot of kids play with this in the sandbox or on the beach or wherever, right? So this toy might be, have two seasons. It might have Q4 holiday season for Christmas. Uh, and it might have the, the summer because kids will take this. Now, it's an indoor-outdoor toy, but a lot of times something like this might have a little bit of a spike in the summer, too. So you have to look at the trends of all of your competitors and really understand what are the sales during that time of year so that I can think three months ahead when that when my order lands, what season will it be? How many, how many more should I order based on that? That's a very good, uh, very good call out that you made. Yeah, great. So uh, I see that you have like a, a lot of different data data in your software. And um, I think that's great that you can analyze everything stuff because uh, that's, that is, I think this is crucial for the start of the product. But I can, uh, I want to talk about uh, like uh, some specific situation. So uh, let's imagine that uh, we already launched the product and uh, our sales uh, are not that great. And uh, imagine that uh, uh, they are, let's say that they are twice bad that we expected. So maybe you have some, uh, some thoughts about how to, how to deal with this stuff, how to deal with, with this uh, stock that left, just not to pay uh, this money for Amazon. Maybe you have some hacks here. Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons that it could be selling worse than you expected. Um, 
the first would be that your design is just not as good or popular, right? Like you, you chose a design of a product that people just don't want as much as the other design. So it might be something that's fatal like that. You just overestimated the performance or the idea and less people want it than the black one. Like you did a nice design and people just want a plain one, right? Um, could be that you're that that you just chose the wrong style. Not your fault, but it happens. It's one of the main reasons we fail sometimes is because we want to be different. We customize and we we do things. We we do as much as we can testing ahead of time, but sometimes the result is not the same as the test, right? Um, the other thing that you have to understand is that when you first launch, you have two levers and two levers only. You have price and you have content. Your content is the main image. It is the message you are sending to the buyer around what you are selling and the quality of your product. The better your content, the higher you can sell your product for, the higher price you can sell. So if you only have those two levers at launch, what a lot of people need to do is you need to impact your conversion rate in the first 30 days during that honeymoon period to be as high as possible. So you need to lower your price and start with a lower price, either a higher price with a big coupon, right? Or a lower price, two different strategies because one allows you to do lightning deals and deals as well. Uh, and then you start to um, update your content and test new images new styles of your image. So with the box, without the box, with a person, without a person, with the contents of the box uh, laid out with uh, just the box, right? There's so many things you can do in a main image that you need to test. Once you find one that is that is getting a better click-through rate, it means the image is good because you don't have reviews, You know your price is low. So you're looking at the click-through rate. You wanna get one that gets a lot of traffic then you can start to try to raise your price up to see if you can match that conversion rate and, and sell more units. So it's, it's a launch that you are testing, testing, testing to dial in that, that, that click-through rate, that performance, that, that conversion rate. If the flaw is fatal and you chose the wrong style, no matter what you do, your click-through rate will only hit a ceiling because that's, all the, that's the demand. You've maximized the demand for that design. The other you thing use, is, uh, yeah. go ahead. Proceed. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I was just going to say the other thing is, what are you doing on a pay-per-click standpoint? And what did you do to write your listing? So where the way you write your listing um, will dictate the relevancy to Amazon. We already saw that with the example with the garlic press. The billion-dollar brand, bad at Amazon, bad at ranking for garlic mincer or garlic crusher because they didn't write it in the title. So did you write your title to maximize the rank? Do you have any holes in your, in your, in your keywords or indexing? And that will impact your traffic and your ability to rank. So um, it will impact the placement of your ad too, because your ad has a relevancy score also. So I've seen personally where I have um, not even just missing a word, but the plural version is missing, right? So I changed the title because it was singular, singular, singular. So it was like um, for boy, for boy, for boy, right? Like toy for boy, toy for boy, toy for boy. Um, but boys was important. Plural was important. So I changed one of the keywords to for boys and all of my boys keywords goes up immediately in rank and all of my ad placement goes up to top of search immediately. Just from changing the title one word, right? So why your product is not performing well could be wrong design, um, charging too much, bad content, bad writing, uh, bad PP, uh, bad, bad, bad ads, like not, not the right ad format and not enough ad traffic, right? So you have to diagnose 
all of those things quickly every day, like really understand it at a very high level. It's a lot of learning curves there, but you have to diagnose it quickly. You have to adjust. You have to test different things independently very quickly and iterate very quickly. Use the data to iterate. Data, make a decision. Data, make a decision. Within a week of launch, you should have test many things and you should have it dialed in. And then you can really start to push more traffic. Get the conversion right, send more traffic, test the traffic, get, you know, keep dialing it in. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to ask, um, do you use uh, Amazon A-B testing or any other tools to evaluate like a different uh, creatives and titles and stuff? Yeah, we use uh, PickFu a lot. Um, I know the guys, Justin uh, and, and his partner over there, Jason. Um, I, I use PickFu a lot. Um, do you guys have an affiliate with them for your community? Sure. Like a discount? Yeah. Yeah, you should you should probably let everyone know what that is because it can save them a lot of money, right? Um, but PickFu is good. Yeah, that's and, a um, yeah, yeah. So... Um, and what do you think about uh, Amazon uh, A-B testing? Because sometimes we get some controversial results from there. So what's your opinion about I think that? it just takes too long, right? I need results faster. I need data faster. I can't wait two weeks. So I just don't use it that much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brandon, tell, please um, share your opinion. Uh, Amazon um, changes uh, every year and every year uh, less and less sellers uh, can do business on Amazon. So uh, what is what are your predictions about private label on Amazon? Uh, what to expect uh, sellers uh, in, I don't know, five years, for example? It's, it's going to change a lot. Um, AI is going to change everything. Right. Um, just so it's going to change everything because you can go faster and you can you can go and you can make it better faster. So the life cycle of products will go down. Uh, it will be very difficult for people to maintain the best seller rank for for a long time mm -hmm. because people will find better designs faster. Um, before it wasn't before it was almost impossible right if you wanted to try to attack a bestseller you would have to pay a designer a lot of money to design something that was high enough quality to where you could test it right um i remember 20 years ago uh God, maybe not 20 years ago 15 years ago uh, I was uh, working with startups and entrepreneurship, and so we would we would have ideas. I was doing some angel investing, and the way that it would work is that you would use a methodology called lean startup. Now, lean startup means you fail as fast and as cheap as possible. So the premise is that you hack something together, and it can be very ugly, but if you do a good job, even when it's ugly, you'll do a great job when it's pretty, right? But you don't want to spend a lot of money. The mistake a lot of people make is that they spend a lot of money designing something and building something and ordering something, um, whether it's a startup, a software, a program, or a product, before they even know whether people will buy it. Amazon with PicFu and with AI and MidJourney and ChatGPT and a combination of all those things. Now, you can have dozens of ideas and test them in a single day. It's absurd. It's 100 times faster, 100 times cheaper. And so people are going to come for every bestseller in every category. You're going to find that it's going to be very difficult to maintain bestseller status but the, the the good part is that if you're part of the, the the disruptor if you're if you're innovative now uh while everyone is still slow to figure it out then you can really make an impact and you can build a brand really quickly mm -hmm. so i think ai is going to change a lot over the next few years now 
AI for search on Amazon. I think uh, yesterday they announced that they're going to be hiring AI uh, programmers to try to redefine the way that search works on Amazon because AI driven search is better. But what does that mean for us who have spent millions of dollars ranking our, our, our platform? How are they going to value where to put people? It's not going to be the same formula, conversion, click through rate, you know, maybe it will. Maybe they'll still factor that. The AI needs to factor that somehow, right? But we don't know what that ends up looking like. So it's going to shake things up a lot. Um, ultimately, maybe uh, if you get it now, it'll end up better for you, but I don't know. Uh, and I don't know if the AI is going to value reviews. It might. It might be programmed to do that So and taught to do that. So we don't know. Um, but with Data Dive, we are building two AI tools that are releasing in the next uh, two weeks. So. The first tool will be out uh, next week. It is a, uh, a listing, like a niche analyzer. So we will look at all of those competitors the same way we have that deep dive page. And the AI will go and read all of the reviews from every single listing. And it'll look at the, uh, the bullet points and the description of every single competitor. And it will come back to you and give you a brief of the features the benefits, what people like about the product and what they don't like about the product for every single competitor. And that it will, you can compile it into one report that you can use to build your, your product. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that I, I was playing with it yesterday. It's already in the back end in beta for me. Uh, and it's insanely powerful because I can go and test the product. I can, I can do the design. I can find something that's good, but I don't necessarily know how to like what features I need to build into the product. So I would have to spend hours going through watching the videos for the competitors, reading their reviews, looking at the Q and a, uh, looking at their bullets and really try to understand what people are like and don't like about a product. And now the AI does it instantly. It's, it's so good. So fast. The other thing is the AI listing writer. So now I can write a listing that will convert very high because it speaks to the audience in the form of the benefit to the buyer with the right keywords. I can't write that good. I don't think you guys can write that good. I don't know many people that can. The AI can write better than all of us and can do it much faster. So AI is changing things. Everything's going faster. Everything will be better. If you have existing products that are doing okay, your products are in danger. Okay. Okay, I got thank you. Thank you for your opinion. Yeah, that there was some mind blowing stuff. <laughs> okay. So uh another topic that I wanted to talk with you about uh, is such thing as uh, brand awareness. And uh especially I want to know what do you think about uh the role that social media uh play in building this uh, brand awareness? And maybe you have some strategies uh, to work with that stuff and to build some, um, I don't know, cross, cross platform, let's say, uh, things. Yeah, so this might be controversial. I don't think very many people need brand awareness. Um, I think a very small percentage of products need brand awareness very very small percentage where i think you need brand awareness is not brand awareness what you need is validity so what does that mean that means that if someone is thinking about buying your product it's a big decision and they want to make sure that it's legitimate so what are they going to do they're going to google you they're going to look at your website they're going to look at the reviews on amazon and they're going to make a decision from that information. I don't know very many products on Amazon that people will leave Amazon to go research before they buy it. It has to be an expensive product or it has to be a product they consume. So um, outside of those, nit like those specific use cases, I think if you're spending a lot of money to... To, to get in front of a lot of people just so they can see your name a lot. 
uh, you're probably wasting money. Um, and that might be a controversial take, but I, I don't I, I don't see the benefit of it. Now, if you have a product that you have um, a repeat customer and you have lifetime value, skincare, makeup, supplement, basically it, right? Then seeing your brand name a couple times before they go shopping on Amazon can have an impact in your conversion. And the cost of that factored into your, so your customer acquisition cost, your CAC, they call it, um, factoring in that brand awareness into that cost is still less than the lifetime value of, of, of that customer over multiple orders, then it's probably worth it. Outside of those scenarios, if you're selling a product on Amazon or, or on Walmart or, or both, um, you probably don't need to invest in brand awareness. Okay, uh, you just showed us uh, an example of Garlic Press, uh, Vampire Garlic Press. Yeah, and you mentioned that they spend a lot of uh, time and a lot of efforts building uh, some kind of brand awareness through uh, TikTok. So, so what do you so think I'll about say that, that stuff? So what they're doing is not brand awareness. What they're doing is direct sales through live selling and through content selling. Very different, right? So brand awareness campaign is different from a sales campaign. Yeah. Definitely. So um, I think live selling and influencer selling will get increasingly more important for brands. And we're not even close. We're at 1% of where we will be in two years, right? And the reason I can confidently say that is because we know what is happening in China. Um, and you might say that the Chinese market buyer is more conditioned to purchase from influencers and from live. They have multiple live platforms where people sell live to them at all times. They have Taobao, they have Tmall, they have, uh, they have their version of TikTok. The parent company of TikTok has, has its own um, thing. So they have live selling for many years now, and they do billions and billions of dollars a year in online selling, uh, live selling. In America, it's a fraction of that. It's very small because the platforms aren't there and the Americans aren't used to it yet. But I think it's coming. And I think people are warming you up to it. You think this is future? It is definitely the future. And it's the, 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 the spike in, in sales from online live selling will look like a hockey stick for the next two years. And I think we're at 1%. So if, it, if it's already good for certain people like that brand, it will only get better. And so if it's not in your roadmap to explore influencer marketing, influencer sales, live sales, it should be, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you for the answer. Uh, so, uh... Let's talk, I don't, I don't know, some basics. So uh, maybe uh, we could talk about some uh, the most uh, important uh, key performance indicators that you need to uh, evaluate, that you need to know uh, to do your job great and to, uh, to work with uh, Amazon private label and to be uh, efficient, let's say. Yeah, so I think that it really depends on the seat. Um, here's the problem that most people don't grasp, like the concept, right? The concept. When you start a private label brand, um, you're starting a real business. And that real business has many different jobs. It has someone who does product research. It has someone who does product validation. It has someone who does sourcing. It has someone who does logistics. It has someone who writes the listing. It has someone who uh, you know, does the keyword research to write the listing. It has someone who designs the, the content. So the, the, the images and the artwork. It has uh, someone who does your uh, pay-per-click marketing, uh, who updates that who tests it, who, who runs the product and manages the product once it's live. It's a lot of jobs and it's a lot of learning curves. 
And most people don't realize when they start this business, you're wearing every single one of those hats. You're sitting in every single one of those seats and every single one of those seats have a different KPI. So for product research, it might be my leading measure every single day is to research or every single week is to research at least 50 products or uh, sourcing. It might be every single week I need to order samples for at least one product for logistics it might be my uh, my kpi might be uh, out of stock percentage right your out of stock percentage needs to be basically less than one percent uh, or or less than one day per month so whatever your kpi is there your content um percentage might be your your uh keyword indexing uh, for writing, your content for images might be your conversion rate as a KPI. Your uh, your marketing might be your traffic and sessions. So all of these seats have different KPIs, and you wear all of these hats when you start this business. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is very hard to manage. Maybe we can a little bit uh, short this. Uh, list of key metrics maybe like uh one for each uh for each for each job if if we talk about like uh, ppc if we talk about uh um, ceo optimization of the listing and product research so maybe like the more the most important one for each. yeah basically those were the most important ones right like so number of products you research number of samples you order um the uh the the com the click through rate, the conversion rate, uh, the uh, the impressions. Yeah, those are going to be your key metrics that you need to pay attention to because it, again, at the end of the day, whatever your SEO is, you need to make sure that you have no holes in your indexing when you write your listing, that you're running the pay per click to get the right traffic, to get the right data, and that your uh, conversion rate, your click through rate, your revenue are all on point. Um, and your blend of organic, so that's your organic ranks versus your paid ranks are uh, are good enough so that your tacos is low enough that you're profitable. That's basically, that's that's the business. It's, it's four different college level degrees in one business that you have to learn. So it's a very hard business, but it's solved. But it, so I, I don't, I don't say this as explicitly as this, uh, but you can't be a dummy to do this business really well, right? Like you can't stumble into this business and not be very smart um, and, 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 and do really well for this business consistently. You can get lucky. You can choose the right product. You can stumble into it, maybe. But to really drive and build a multi-million dollar business, you have to be pretty smart. You also need a little bit of money. So you need capital to, 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 to fund the business. And so it takes a combination of those two things plus grit. You need to work your ass off every single day and know that you're competing against millions of other people. And I was at my office here until 4 a.m. the last two nights because I have deadlines for products that I'm ordering for my brand. I don't know anyone that is putting in the hours that I'm putting in because I slept four hours last night. And so, and I'm going to do 30 million this year in, in, in my brands um, because of it, right? So a lot of people will be okay with sleeping at night and doing 2 million. And then uh, in order to scale my team and scale my business and make the right decisions and improve my conversions and improve my chances of success, I've taken the lead again in my company for choosing the product. So I, when I got back from China uh, three weeks ago, I had over a hundred products to analyze from a thousand products that I saw in Amazon or in, in China. And it's myself, my wife, and one team member going through every single one of those at a very high level. And now working on final designs uh, with the fact with, uh, with, with my design team and with the factories. So you have to work your ass off. You have to be smart and you have to have money. And if you have those three things, you can make, you can, you can have life-changing money.
Yeah, you okay. do a lot of a lot of job <laughs> there. Uh, okay, we have spoken more than hour, and um, I will ask my uh, last question and return to our guest questions. Uh, so, Brendan, uh, share please your success stories and case studies when you implement in uh, your business and achieve uh, significant uh, result on Amazon. A lot of our lessons were very early on, right? Um, it was from failing. It was from choosing a product that we didn't understand how we were going to sell it first. So I did uh, active noise canceling headphones in 2017, maybe. Maybe the end of 2016, even. It's been a long time. So I did those. Uh, I did. Yeah, it was probably uh, 2016, beginning of 2017 and 2016. Um, and they failed. I spent $40,000 on inventory and that was a lot, a lot of money for us. It's still a lot of money, but that was a lot of money for us then because our brand was barely doing a million dollars. And the reason it failed is because the keywords that I wanted to rank for, first of all, I didn't identify all of them in the beginning. I knew that active noise canceling headphones were a newer market. There was only one keyword for it, not a lot of people searching for it. And the generic keywords of wireless headphones, Bluetooth headphones, headphones, they all had options that were much, much cheaper and options that were major brands. So my brand of headphones is not going to convert like Beats or JBL or Sony. My brand of headphones at $80 is not going to compete against a cheap set of headphones for $15. So I needed to understand why am I having trouble ranking and why did I, why did I make a mistake choosing that product? Those mistakes, understanding the root cause of those mistakes has led us to improve our success rate and improve our brand, uh, improve our business. It has led to us growing almost double every single year for the last six years. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, let's go to uh, questions uh, in our chat box. And first question from somebody from iPhone 14. Uh, what do you think about products like Jungle Scout uh, to identify products to sell? Jungle Scout's great. Um, so we just recently partnered with them with Datadive for data. So we use a lot of their data. We, uh, we purchase their data we turn it around and display it in our in our own way for you uh, when you use Datadive. And their tool is extremely affordable, especially if you're going to use it for the product discovery feature. They also have a sourcing feature, which is really interesting too, because it can reverse engineer a competitor and help you find a factory because they, they import the data from the uh, customs. So that tool is very, very cool and very powerful as well. So I loved I loved some of the tools on Jungle Scout a lot. I think it's a I think it's a good product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Next question: Does the text in I plus content get uh, in indexed on Amazon or not? And uh, I see Matt Atkins uh, gave yeah. his answer. What's and up, Matt? To be yeah, honest, uh, we, we, we think so as well. But maybe you have uh, other opinion. The answer is yes. The, the biggest mistake people make, though, is that they'll delete the description field and then they get de-indexed. So don't delete whatever you have in the back end. Uh, just leave it there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question. How can you differ in a niche where it's impossible to differ? All products look the same. Uh, this is the nature of the this niche. Yeah, I probably wouldn't do that product then. I don't want to do a product where you have I was arguing with my team yesterday. They want to do a product. A lot of sellers are making a lot of sales and I hate products like that. I know we can do a quality product. I know, but how am I going to stand out besides our brand name having some weight now because we have a lot of customers? Um, I just don't want to do a meet, like it's a me too product, they call it. So I just, uh, I'm trying to do more customization. Uh, and I think that someone will come in and disrupt the market soon on a lot of those because of AI. So um, just probably avoid that product altogether. Liquidate it, move on to a product that you have an advantage from the design. You have an mm -hmm. advantage from keywords. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what is the best way to get rid of an uh, unprofitable business? Yeah, so there's two two ways. Um, I think you can liquidate. You can liquidate uh, two ways. You can liquidate to Amazon. You can liquidate to sellers, or you can liquidate to a third party off of Amazon. Mm -hmm. The uh, the other part, the other way is that you can um, you can uh, donate it. So you recall it directly to a not for profit organization. They give you a check. Uh, or they don't give you a check, they give you a receipt, and then you can use that against your profits uh, in the US at least. So depending on where your entity is, and the profit of your business, you can use that slip to, uh, to maybe have uh, some tax benefits. And that will be, um, that'll save you the money. So uh, a lot of times it's better to donate it than it is to destroy it. The third option is just destroy it and take the right off the loss. So you need to weigh those three options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and okay. uh, I, I have like a last question for this one. So, uh, what is the point when you understand that uh, this uh, particular business or product is a failure? So, uh, when you understand that you tried everything and uh, make a decision to quit. To, to read the end of this business. Yeah, I think it's pretty apparent within the first two weeks of launch when you've tested multiple main images. Um, you know, you're maybe it was a botched launch because of indexing. You didn't save the honeymoon. You wrote it wrong. Uh, the indexing is wrong. Maybe you realize that the content, like you just keep working on the content and it's not improving. Um, there's just something that your click through rate conversion rate is just not going to um, to be there. So you probably chose the wrong product because most of the keywords are generic. And they convert low and you can't you can't it's going to cost you a lot more money to rank for them over time um there's not a solid foundation of relevant keywords to target first right so a lot of it comes down to product selection and answering those questions in the in data dive once you answer those questions you'll get a score most of the time when a product fails the score is negative or low right it's uh it's it's you look back at it you break it down, you really try to understand why it failed, then it's usually pretty obvious at that point. So um, conversion rate, click-through rate, generic keywords, uh, and uh, just didn't, you know, didn't, didn't prepare, your design isn't good. You can usually figure that out within the first two weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, I think that's kind of normal stuff when uh, you didn't perform well for the first couple of weeks uh, for the product. But uh, where is that line that you understand that you uh, that you perform like much worse uh, even for the first weeks? I think it's just when you know you're converting significantly worse than your competition. So what we do is we we find that equilibrium, right? I told you the two things you can control are content and price at launch. You're performing poorly. You need to lower your price, right? Um, you lower your price to a point where you start to perform well from a conversion standpoint. Now, the question is, if you have a $15 product and you have to lower your price to $6, that's a really big problem, right? That means you're losing a lot of money, but you found the equilibrium. You found the point at which people are willing to buy your product over the other options. And if it's $9 cheaper, it's, it's significantly a third the price, right? Cheaper then you have a major flaw with your product, with your design, with your image, with something. So you need to find out what that flaw is and start addressing it. And then when, as you address those things, if you can't raise your price, then the product is no good. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I have one more question in my private messages. Uh, so what is uh, the uh, target, um, what is the target, uh, uh, numbers that you have for the uh, organic and paid uh, traffic for today on Amazon. So uh, is it like, uh, do you have some uh, gold standard for that? Like uh, target cost per click or? No, uh, like uh, target orders from organic and from uh, uh, paid, from advertisement. Maybe you have like, uh, 
Yeah, it really uh, depends like, on the phase. It depends on the phase of the product, right? At launch, it's all 100% paid. Within a few days, you should be ranking and getting some organic. Um, so I look at it more from a tacos perspective. I might have it. I have an old presentation that I had pulled up with some slides. Maybe I can pull one up for you. Okay. But let's say we're talking about like um, some old brand or old product. So it's not a new one. And uh, do you consider that if you have like a 50 50 uh, pay to advertise, uh, advertisements? Uh, I think 50% is and... on the high end. I think that that's uh, dangerous. I think above 50% is dangerous. So the for, goal for should paid be. Traffic. The, should, the, yeah, the goal should be, uh, and it really depends on the lifetime value because a lot of times um, the more aggressive categories, a lot of the sales and acquisition are coming in from paid. So uh, it depends on the niche too. But for the products that I'm in with uh, baby and toys and travel, um, I, I definitely want to be less than 50% paid. Okay. So can we say uh, if we have like uh, 50 or less uh, for organic traffic, in this case, uh, we have some problems with our uh, CEO. Is it like, a, 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 can yeah, we establish it's, it's, this? There's uh, definitely the something wrong on the SEO side if it's, um, if it, if it's like that, for sure. If I, um, let me tell you what the average right now for the last uh, 30 days on my brand, because I have, I have launches for summer. I can just say, So organic units, total units. So 47,000 and what was the PPC 22? Yeah, so it's like a, a, it's like a, a third, 22,649 divided by 4707, 47,407. So, uh, sorry, yes? Yeah, under 50% for sure. So, um, and my overall tacos was 15% for the last 30 days and under 50% paid uh, for my brand with 14% margin net. Uh, oh, it actually has it. It's, uh, yeah, 13.5. So, yeah, this is even bordering on the being too much. Um, and I can probably just share. Let me see something. I just snipped this just now. So This is higher than I would like, right? I think average for a new product, uh, an exi like an existing product should be under 10%. I think that um, for a product you just launched, it could be over third, like um, at launch, it's infinite. Uh, in growth, it could be 50, 60% uh, going down to 30%. And then uh, in, in, in growth, um, later, more, more mature growth should be uh, under 30%. And then at maintenance, like something that's already established should be under 10%. So as a blend with over 300 SKUs, I'm at 14.8, which is a little high, right? But I think we just launched maybe five or seven products um, for summer. So I think uh, that it raised the average a little bit. So, and then the PPC units divided by the total units uh, came out to like 46% or something. So, um but this is why our margin is lower, right? Our margin is only 13.5, but at scale. So it's, uh, yeah. If you're above that, it's really tough to make a profit. It, it, it's because a larger percentage of your products just launched. So the, the percentage of products you have in different phases will impact your averages as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, of course, I think that's uh, always depend on the, like, uh, the profit margin that your product can, uh, the, that your product have. Well, the, the, problem, so, the problem with just looking at it from a margin perspective is that paid ads will convert lower than organic. So your blended average will be worse if your percentage of paid sales is higher. So it's healthier 
for your average conversion rate to have more organic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's 100% true. Okay, okay, we, we have uh, two more questions in uh, the chat box. And uh, the question is, what do you think about other e-commerce business models like high ticket uh, drop shipping via Shopify? Uh, drop shipping, I'm not a fan of at all. You don't really own anything. Um, so I think anyone anyone doing that is uh, really just trying to make a quick dollar. They're not building a real business. Shopify mm -hmm. is um, Shopify when you own the brand and you develop the products and you spend time and you have a real brand can be very good. But it's it's there's a lot of art to that that and science to that that is much. Um, it's a different learning curve than Amazon, and it only works for. Um, certain niches uh versus others right so toys on on shopify when your average price point for a toy is twenty dollars uh is almost impossible right because you you have to be able to get an average order size of a certain amount to in order to justify the cost of acquisition so you spend money on ads a certain percentage click and go in and convert so your acquisition cost might be a dollar a click and one in 10 purchase something. So you're at $10 to sell a $20 toy. It's not going to work, right? So you need like a $40 minimum average order, usually for the product you're going to sell. And, um, and it's different content. It's, it's, it's follow-ups, it's retargeting, it's lifelong value. There's, there's a whole new business to Shopify versus Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and the last question is, um, do you think it's realistic for someone working a full-time job to work alone trying to develop a successful e-commerce business? 100%. 2023, I mean, I yeah, 100%. I think that if you think about the journey, <coughs> you're going to spend a lot of time learning for the first forever, you're going to learn forever, but the um, first six months, you're going to spend time learn, learning how to identify good products, to research, to source, to get, to get samples, right? That's going to take you a couple months before you find a product that you're finally going to order, but that's going to be five to 10 hours a week. Then you're going to learn the next phase, which is going to be the shipping, the content, the, uh, the the images, the design of it, right? The design of the images and the listing. You could do all that while it's on the water, uh, which is another 45 days, right? So you've got all this time to learn while you're still working. You just work at night and on weekends. And, um, and then that product launches four to six months later from when you started. And you have to learn PPC, you have to learn how to turn on ads, you have to learn how to adjust them, how to optimize them, uh, how it's impacting the keyword ranks, how to monitor things, how to, how to basically manage that product. And at that time, you're probably starting the process over with another product or two at that time, because now you feel more comfortable. So it's a year and you only have one to three active products. That's not enough money to sustain yourself and to pay your bills, probably, right? So you should be working somewhere else full time. Uh, usually, that's the journey most people take. They learn this business while they're working somewhere else full time. They start doing it on the side. And then a year down the road, they have three to five products. Two years down the road, they have 10 to 15 products. And they're making more money, a lot more money than their job is paying them. And they can make the decision at that point. When it, the 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 way that I tell my students, and I've created over a hundred millionaires with my with my program, with my teaching program, the way I tell my students is, when it's costing you money to go to your job, is when you quit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have spoken one and a half hour, and. Um, mm -hmm. 
And we're going to finish our web conference. It was very interesting. Uh, and Brandon, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your time. And maybe you have something to say or add something. I uh, I appreciate I appreciate you guys having me on. I hope this was helpful for people that are on live and the the replay. And um, look, it's it's a hard business. Make sure you're committed to it. Um, don't. There's the reasons people fail is because they weren't necessarily smart enough. They didn't have the money. The other reason people fail is because they're arrogant, because they think that they're much smarter than they are. They think they know more than they do. Be open to learning, be humble, and, uh, and be a student. Like always invest in yourself and your knowledge and realize that you don't know what you don't know. And with that right attitude and hard work, you'll, you'll be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. And uh, thank you for your time. Have a good day. Have a good sales. Uh, and take care. Yeah, take care it was everyone. a great pleasure talking to you. Bye-bye. Take care, Ross.